living in a community where you cannot imagine tomorrow because of the level of crime, the prives of freedom. You are not fully free as a Republican citizen. And I think, you know, that that, that is something that they understood is that, you know, the, the argument was, should we be free? Are we more free if alcohol is per- permitted? Or are we more free if alcohol is banned? Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that sort of robust notion of freedom has, is something that we've lost. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And boy, do we have a great episode for you guys today, especially since YouTube decided to take away our Steve Bannon interview. Yes, if uh, you managed to catch that last week, um, enjoy, because I don't think they're going to let it back on YouTube. Um, No one will get to see, see Steve in all his shirts. Yes. Uh, unless you go on Rumble, which is honestly where you should be listening to this stuff. Anyway, support alternative platforms. They're more needed than ever. Um, we just got done having an awesome conference last week up from chaos, conserving American security. Nick was an absolute superstar getting that together. Um, we had seven keynote speakers, 14 different panelists. It was 21, um, you know, fantastic speakers. Well, 19 fantastic speakers, then me and Emil. Um, so, you know, real, real high quality folks. We'll be trickling that, out that content on all of our streams over the next few Uh, days and weeks here. You'll hear the speeches from Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, Matt Rosendale, Dan Bishop, J.D. Vance, David Sachs, and uh, Joe Kent. And then all the panels we had, um, regime stenographers, the future, rotten branches. Um, We had some fun with the naming. and uh, You uh, had some fun with the naming. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Always do, baby. Um, So yeah, thank you guys if you managed to make it out to that. Uh, We know it was a bit short notice, and uh, I think we're we're gonna try to do some more. So if you ever have any ideas for an issue specific conference, um, shoot us a message. We may be more game than you think. Uh, But this week we have a stellar episode for you guys. Um, One of the issues that I care the most about it's the issue that radicalized me in politics is crime, and we are in the middle of an unprecedented crime wave in the United States. Actually, it's very precedented. It's precedented in the 1990s. And the saddest thing about that is that we're making the same mistakes that we made before that. We assume that you can just lift all the shackles off the society and everyone will behave like a fairy godmother pixie bunny rabbit. And turns out they won't. People commit crimes. They shoot each other in the head. They commit gangland murders. It's like not fun. And so we had one of the smartest younger people talking about this issue today, Charles Fain Lehman. He's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, working primarily on policing and public safety, and he's a contributing editor at City Journal. He was previously a staff writer with the Washington Free Beacon, where he covered domestic policy from a data-driven perspective, and his work on criminal justice, immigration, and social issues has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Review Online, and Tablet, among other publications. He's also a contributing writer with the Institute for Family Studies, led by our friend Brad Wilcox, who we've had on the show before. And he's originally from Pittsburgh, and now lives in Maryland suburbs uh, of Washington, D.C. Um, we talked about everything. Uh, we talked about alcohol and drug policy. We talked about um, the homeless. We talked about D.C. We talked about 1994 crime bill. We talked about this crime wave. We talked about, um, you know, broken windows policing. We talked about the privatization security. We, it's it's jam packed. We got to a ton. It was a fun conversation. Charles is a fun guy. He's got a new podcast of his own, which you should definitely check out. Um, what do you think, Nick? It was great. Uh, I, I, you know, I came out as a uh, pro prohibition guy uh, <laughs> during this episode, which was which was fun. Uh, Nick to read talk about. one book about prohibition. I read one book and I'm like, yeah, now I'm radicalized. I mean, I was I was kind of many such cases. Yeah. Uh, I was um, I was kind of pro prohibition previously, but I like it was one of those things where I didn't know enough about it. And then now that I read this book, I'm like, yeah, I could talk about it for hours. Um, we talked about prohibition. Um, I also think it's funny uh that he <laughs> at some point during the episode he talks about we had not talked about the fact that i grew up in honduras and then he talks about uh you know how many how many people are imprisoned in honduras and that it's not nearly enough um so it, yeah we had a we had a lot of fun talked about personal experiences about crime um about uh how all our metropolitan areas are going to hell um yeah it was a it was a great episode um and really excited to get into it yeah absolutely we'll go now to charles f lehman charles thank you for coming on the podcast absolutely thank you for having me we always like to know how people got to where they are today um why did you become a professional person who wants to put more people in jail 
<laughs> you know, I, I think I've accused myself of that. No, so my professional trajectory uh, after college, I worked in politics for just a little bit. Um, but then I, I really got into this through through journalism. I worked for uh, a new site, The Washington Free Beacon, which does still, I think, great investigative reporting on a variety of topics. And, you know, I was a journalist by profession, had a little bit of a not even a strong quantitative background so much as a, a grasp on data on numbers, on programming, and directed those interests towards those, those capacities towards topics that interested me. Um, and sort of said, well, you know, one of our responsibilities is to say, where don't the stories make sense? Where don't they line up? Um, and criminal justice is, is, a, is a space where over the past 10, 15 years, there should have been a, a standard story. Um, there's, a, there's a professor at Fordham, his name is John Pfaff, who I disagree with frequently and vehemently on Twitter. But John wrote a book called uh, Locked In in which he, he points out correctly that, you know, a narrative had come to dominate – um, American thinking about criminal justice that, you know, we incarcerated too many people. They were all in for drug crimes. The police were all racist. Uh, we need comprehensive bipartisan criminal justice reform now. Um, and I said, OK, I'm interested in this topic. I, I have sort of a standing interest in criminal justice as a topic. And I want to get sort of underneath what's really going on here. Um, and I think the moment for me that was – uh, sort of engage more fully was realizing you can go count the number of people who are in prison for drugs. It's fourteen percent uh, of people in state prisons are in for drugs. Most of those drug traffickers. More than half people are in for violent crimes. And the sort of that obvious disparity between what I'd been told was true, what was sort of the general assumption, and what was actually true if you spent five minutes reading reports from the Bureau of Justice Statistics said, okay, there's a story there. There's a there's 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 a profound disparity between what we what what I believe to be true and what was actually true. And so I dug deeper and deeper and deeper, um, both into the numbers as they existed, into the history of criminal justice in the United States, which is I think much more complicated than, the, than that same story tells us, into the policy, um, and you know the past five years five years of my career have been. Uh, an education, a self-education, understanding crime is an issue and understanding what causes crime, how we control crime, the importance and significance of impact of crime on the communities that are most often victimized by crime. And then, you know, taking that knowledge and uh, distributing it, whether it be over Twitter, whether it be through uh, journalism, magazine articles, or in my capacity at the Manhattan Institute as a fellow where I write reports and I do original analysis. Um Oh, it's sort of this mind towards saying uh, crime is a problem that we don't take seriously enough and we have to weigh the costs of crime, which are, uh, you know, there, there, there's a ballpark estimate, 2017, the total cost of crime in dollar terms is $20 trillion. Um, I can talk through how that, you get to that estimate. But we don't, we don't weigh that, crime, that cost enough in our, uh, in our, in our calculus, in our day-to-day -day calculus. So that's, you know, that's uh, really, really – Pushing that point and understanding understanding the significance of that is is how I got to I don't know picking the fights that I do is how I got yeah. to uh, maybe we should lock up more people not fewer for example. <laughs> well, you made a pretty good bet as far as picking an issue area specialization because um, crime has been a big story the last few years. Yes. So um, tell us about that. We're in a crime wave, um, not unprecedented but very precedented, and uh, that's why we should be concerned. What's going on? How long has it been going on and why has it happened? Yeah, well, so and, and I think the long arc of history is important here. Starting in the 1960s, crime in the United States rose dramatically for decades. Um, between uh, 1960 and 1984 was the peak of the violent crime wave. The mid-1980s is the peak of the homicide rate, property crime across the board, dramatic increases. And then in the early to mid-1990s, crime fell. It fell substantially, significantly. Um, across the board, across the country, across measures. Uh, this is like a, a miracle, a social miracle. We still don't really have a good explanation for why it happened. There are lots of different competing explanations. I talk about them. Um, but what I think is important is that if you are an American under the age of probably 40, certainly under the age of 30, uh, then you are – you do not remember a time when crime was like it was at the peaks in the 1980s. You don't remember the crack era. You don't remember when Times Square was like full of vagrancy and violence. Um, rather, what we've had first was a dramatic decline through the 90s into the early 2000s and then sort of a plateauing. 
um, through the mid 2000s up through uh, 2015, 2016, there was sort of a, a spike, particularly in homicide in 2015, 2016, which co occurred with, you can debate about causality, co occurred with uh, the protests in Ferguson. Um, but I think, you know, we, we, we've had this sort of stable low level of crime for several decades. 2020, sudden dramatic increases in certain kinds of crime. Um, homicide, there was a nearly 30% increase is the largest increase on record since we started counting in the 1960s. Increases in aggravated assaults, which are uh, ag assault is just another word for shooting and shooting is just another word for homicide that didn't work. Um, <laughs> order 12%. Uh, increases in grand theft auto um, or car theft, which uh, anecdotally I suspect is related to the other two insofar as people steal cars to commit drive-bys. Um, there's there's uh, both my evidence talking to people who've been involved in the scene and also reporting from Chicago suggests that's a lot of what is driving the spike. Um, so we cars have gotten a lot more valuable all of a sudden. <laughs> car, car, cars recently got a lot more valuable. Yeah. But so these dramatic increases in violent crime, uh, property crime remained low. Well, that's partially because of changes associated with the pandemic. There were fewer people out to steal from. And if you look at your risk of being victimized relative to the number of people on the streets, that went up too. Um, and then over the past year, uh, we've continued to see increases in violence, not of the same magnitude, but still increases. And we've also started to see other signs of disorder, decay, whether it be in large cities, increases in shoplifting, uh, increases in unchecked vagrancy, unchecked homelessness, unchecked vandalism. Um, we don't yet know what property crime looked like more generally in the United States. We won't know that until probably September, October of this year when the FBI puts those numbers out. We can guess at it a little bit. But I think it is fair to say that we remain, based on the city data, across the board, crime looks much worse than it did in 2019, pre-pandemic, pre-summer uh, of George Floyd, pre-protests against the police, pre-all of these different dramatic changes that happened, which I suspect are all involved in uh, the the crime wave that we're currently experiencing. Yeah, you just said like nine different things that uh, <laughs> that interest me and that I want to ask about. So I'll start, you know, from the beginning. You talked about uh, kind of the peak of this crime wave in '94, um, and then it started to drop off. And you, you know, there are a lot of different reasons uh, as to why. Um, I'd like to delve a little deeper into that. What some of those reasons yep. may be, but also. In what ways can can the causes and maybe some of the solutions be tied to the crime wave that we're experiencing now? Yeah. So the first thing to understand is that the decline was international. Um, it happens across developed countries. Um, I tend to think that a substantial – so the, the ballpark estimate in the United States, if you, you sort of population adjust, um, crime is disproportionately committed by young people. A major driving factor there is that the baby boomers aged into and then aged out of crime. So we have this big hump in our population mm. of like people who are crime prone and they're not crime prone anymore. The ballpark estimate is it's about half of the, of the rise in decline is driven by that. That leaves about half unexplained. Um, some percentage of it – the guesses are between five and ten, uh, is driven by uh, incarceration and the increase of incarceration in the 80s. If you put people in prison, they're not out on the streets, but you get diminishing returns on incarceration. Um, who you can efficiently incarcerate for how long. Uh, when you sort of think about the remaining 40%, 45%, um, I think that a lot of it, particularly in large cities, is driven by innovation in policing. You know, there's a there's a long period of time in American history when we firmly believe that police can't control crime. Um, there's there's lots of social science that says police can't control crime. The reason the social science says this is that it finds correlations between police, the level of policing and the level of crime, because when crime goes up, people hire more cops. <laughs> um, we now have lots of better social science that police that says police can control crime. That's a separate conversation. So in the 90s, we really get much more innovative. We invest more in policing. Uh, Bill Clinton says we want to hire 100,000 police officers. It's actually close to 60,000, but he hires a bunch, puts them on the street. People like Bill Bratton in New York put lots of time and energy into thinking about how to police hot spots of crime better. So we take policing much more seriously. And then I think, you know, a large portion of it is basically once you get those initial gains, so much of crime is driven by the capacity of a community to police itself, right? The the cops are the last resort. It's 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 uh, grandma who yells at the kids to cut it out. 
It's it's the shopkeeper who pushes somebody away. It's everyone who glares at the guys who are racing dirt bikes. That's what controls crime in the first place. So once you sort of get those initial gains, there's a there's a, a buildup effect where communities have permission to police themselves, and so they get more and more able to police themselves. Um, you know, I think the recent increases, uh, I suspect, as I you know, is 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 a function of many of these factors. Um, I alluded sort of directly to depolicing as part of it. Uh, I there there is evidence that there are declines in police staffing in many major cities. Um, police leaving departments for suburbs, according to professional together, mm-hmm. you lose that capacity. Police who are less willing to do the work of policing, you lose that capacity. Uh, you lose power to enforcing its crime. But I think it's bigger than that. You know, COVID drove and COVID imposed restrictions drove lots of changes in the capacity of society to police itself. It reduced prison jail capacity. It meant fewer people, fewer high schoolers in school, some more on the street. It meant fewer people in jobs, some more on the street. Uh, and I think it meant in general, fewer people, fewer what we like call eyes on the street, fewer people out and watching and enforcing the the community's ability to police itself. Um, you know, people can go back and forth about whether or not those trade-offs were worth it. But certainly, uh, you know, I think I, I I think that one of the lessons, the you know, those those causes that I alluded to, we have ratcheted back those tools of social control over the past two years, and unsurprisingly, we saw a dramatic increase in misbehavior by the people who those tools are meant to control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that that you were talking about there that I want to bring to, you know, this twenty twenty crime wave is talking about both kind of how law enforcement is feeling on their own, but also how communities are not self-policing as much anymore. I'm wondering how much does perception and the way that we think about our community and also law enforcement, um, how does that how does that shape the way that, you know, we police crime? I, I, I think that a lot of especially what I see here in D.C. is like it's been very prevalent in the last like two to three years. You know, people driving by like screaming F you pig out the window when they see a cop. And you mentioned like these dirt bike gangs, right? People are really, um, you know, skittish on, you know, reporting on anyone that's a, that's of another race. People are, are, are very, you know, especially in a liberal city like this one, very conscious of that. So how do the ways that, that we think about these things make this crime wave different? Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think, I think, um, we talk specifically about policing, uh, you know, the police have always had to deal with protesters. They've always had to do with people cursing them out and calling them racists and pigs and whatever. Um, I don't think that's good, but I think they know that that's true. I think that when, when you talk to cops, the concern is much more that those people, people who believe those things are now in positions of power in many major mm-hmm. cities, that, you know, policing involves split second decision making that is about saving your or somebody else's life, the decision to use your service arm or your, your service weapon, the decision to attack somebody or not attack somebody to get involved in physical altercation. Um, and I think a lot of the reason that police will step back is not because, you know, people are out protesting against them in the streets. That happens. But because they don't believe that civilian authorities are on their side. They don't mm-hmm. believe that yeah. the mayor, the chief, the district attorney is going to have their back. Not if they make a heinous mistake, you know, uh, I've never spoken to a cop who said, I think Derek Chauvin did the right thing. I think basically every cop I've spoken to is like, yeah, that guy seemed crazy. He, he probably killed him. That's bad. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of space between that and never using your service weapon between that and, you know, retreating from a police station because the city won't back you up. And so you have to give it over to the chop protesters. Um so I think, you know, I think that perception on the side of cops matters. But then when you talk about community perception, which I think is the other half of the coin, um, so much of the of the policing revolution of the 90s and early 2000s, we talk a lot about broken windows policing. Nobody has any idea what broken windows policing means, right? Everybody everybody uses the term and nobody uses it consistently. Broken you go back, windows policing is where Rudy Giuliani invades your house in right, the middle of the night. Right. Bro- 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 <laughs> Shakes you down for stolen gumballs. <laughs> bro- broken windows policing, which is stop and frisk, even though they're completely different things. If you go back and read um, in the Atlantic in the 1970s, um, uh, James Q. Wilson and George Kelling uh, wrote the original article, bro- uh, Fixing Broken Windows. The point of broken windows is not actually that if you 
uh, enforce against minor crimes that will deter major crimes. The point is that if you preserve order in the community, then the community will be better empowered to protect itself. That like if the cop is there making sure that the most antisocial actors stay in line, then he will be a backstop to the other informal methods of social control that are sort of like the – you know, th- this is part of the crazy thing about – so to some of these defund the police types, they're like, we want to replace the cops with community self-governance, community self enforcement And I'm like, the, part of that is having cops so that when the community self-governance isn't working, you have somebody you can call who can use the physical force of the state. Um, but, you know, you look at, you look at, uh, there's again, Wesley Scogan who's a criminologist, uh, Northwestern, who did lots of work going to um, police meeting, to, to police public meetings. And in these meetings, the concerns people would raise aren't like, there's a murderer down the street. They would be like, these these teens are, they're tagging their stuff with uh, graffiti. They're dirt bike racing. They are, you know, there's, there's somebody drinking on my stoop every day. And, you know, th- th- this is not like, this is not like white suburban moms. This is like poor black Chicagoans who are forced to live alongside crime. And it's when you target those issues, you're empowering the community to take control of itself, to, to drive out antisocial behavior and like live more peacefully and therefore more prosperously. Yeah. There's a very like specific version of this issue that I was that I was just thinking about uh, yesterday. I was driving by the Capitol and anyone that's here in D.C. knows that Capitol Police is like notorious for pulling people over for the most minor infractions. Like you can be going two miles an hour over the speed limit. So you'll be going like 27. They'll pull you over. They'll write you a ticket. No exceptions. But yesterday when I was driving up to our office, the, a whole group of like guys driving ATVs and um, and they're doing like wheelies right by Capitol Police. Nothing. Nothing. They won't do any. Do you know why? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. It's, so it's, go ahead. It's because MPD is prohibited from engaging in high-speed chases. And mm. you'll stop and they won't. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I just finished a book War about... War on normal people. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so I, I, I just finished a book about um, a, a Georgetown professor became a, became a reserve officer in the MPD um, and she wrote a book about it. it's called Tangle Life in Blue. Um, it's a, it's 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 an okay book. Um, but this is one of the things she talks about is you know you see these guys racing around. Why doesn't the MPD ever do anything? And the answer is because they're legally prohibited from doing it because the co- the risks the the determination of the risks involved in a high speed chase is uh, are are greater than the benefits of catching them. And so when the cops turn on his light, you will stop. They will not. And that's why they don't wow. do anything. I find this concept of um, the the social circumstances that determine on the margins whether or not people commit crimes really interesting because, um, you know, the, the sense of public disorder is very oppressive. Like it makes you constantly on edge and it, it's hard to operate in public life, especially in very dense public areas and cities mainly, um, if you feel like there's crime happening all around you. And then you also have to imagine that social justification for finding, uh, for to put it euphemistically, slippage in rules increases the more rules people see being betrayed. Is is it a degenerative cycle like that? Is that in evidence in the social science? Yeah, I mean, well, so there's there's this sort of heated debate about how you measure that and the extent to which you have to be concerned about that. Um, there's you know there's this sort of early and then later evidence on, uh, for example, if you tag up a mailbox, people are much more willing to. Uh, go go break the mailbox or go do things in, uh, take the mail out of the mailbox. Um, some of the early uh, yeah some of the early broken windows research is is a little more iffy than that in my opinion. But I think in general, one of two things is true. Um, in social science you talk about the intensive margin and the extensive margin. The extensive margin is sort of the breadth, and the intensive is like is like the the severity of the phenomenon. So it, it is both. It is conceivably the case that a more disordered environment makes people offend more likely to offend on the extensive margin. The guy who's on the margins of offending or not is more likely to do it. And I think that may or may not be true. But people are pretty strongly governed by. Uh, norms, it's sort of hard to shift them. It does matter, but I think it matters less than the intensive margin, which is that for a, a, a certain subset of the population, um, the the ten percent of offenders who commit ninety percent of the crime, um, as my colleague Rafael Mangua likes to say, uh, uh, criminals don't specialize. <laughs> um, the guy who is going to go out and shoot somebody tomorrow 
also hops the turnstile. He also sprays graffiti. He also refuses to show up for his desk appearance ticket. He also is he he's he's has tinted windows and he is driving twenty miles over the speed limit and he also has a gun in his car. Um, a fun fact that I learned: forty percent of guns recovered by the NYPD in twenty twenty were recovered in car stops. Um, and so so you know I, I I think it is much the case that that. Disorder of that sort permits people who are otherwise prone to antisocial behavior to engage more fully in that antisocial behavior. They are less checked. There are fewer checks on them. As as much as it does, you know, it, it affects the marginal person of deciding to commit any antisocial behavior whatsoever. What about how our cities are designed, urban scenery, and kind of the physical environment around us helps or hurts crime? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a whole really fascinating school going back to Jane Jacobs, the legendary urbanist, called Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, CPTED. Um, there are lots of really cool. There's lots of really cool research being done in this space. Um, so, for example. Uh, there's a there's a street lighting uh, randomized trial that they did in New York, looking at street lights being set up in projects, and they found that the dramatic reduction in crime in areas that were better lit relative to ones that were less well lit. Um, clearing vacant lots substantially reduces shootings around the vacant lots because you make them hostile to drug dealing and other gang related activity. Greening public spaces, same basic concept. Um, all of these, by the way, these are, you know, these are, this is like high quality social science. Like you, they're, they're, they're randomizing, they're identifying a causal effect. Like that's the good stuff. Um, there's a, there's, there's sort of a whole body, uh, there's a whole body of evidence that looks specifically at this stuff. And the way that, you know, I think there are two different ways to interpret this. People like to look at this and go, oh, greening public spaces is nice. It's pretty. It increases people's like effective experience of the world. So it's like, I don't think that's true. I think it indicates that the environment is well cared for, that you are being, that the people around you are watching you and that this is not the kind of place where you can offend. Um, there's a great there's a great story in, uh, there's a sociologist named Elijah Anderson who wrote a great book called Code of the Street about um, life in Philly in the 1990s. Uh, and and there's a story in this where one of his one of his subjects um, he he's he's like joining a gang uh, and he and a friend they're they're in like a they're in a they're in an honor dispute basically the whole book is about you know honor culture and gangs um, and before before they're like okay we got to settle this we have to like go fight each other and before they fight each other they say okay let's go behind this building <laughs> um, it's like these are not guys who you know care a lot these are guys that commit crimes like they don't care mm -hmm. but even they know we can't do this in public like we cannot be surveilled we gotta we're gonna go behind this building and then we're gonna punch each other and it'll be better um, but like <laughs> do <Dude's> that rock. <laughs> you know right but like but like people move you know be, people people's behavior is shaped by. Uh, what they think the, what the world around them communicates to them about what they can get away with and what they can't. And that matters a huge amount. And by the way, stuff like that is something that you can agree with on a bipartisan basis. Mm -hmm. You know, people can agree with greening vacant lots. People can agree with uh, with uh, putting up more streetlights. That's, that's you know, it's, it's something everyone can get behind, which I think is good. Well, but when this public improvement stuff happens and then property values start to rise, that's called gentrification. And so there's an entire constituency baked in that seems to be pre-politically committed to making places as miserable as possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think that's part and parcel with a sort of totalizing abolitionist mindset. You look at somebody like, uh, you know, you, a police abolitionist like Alex Vitale, who wrote a book called The End of Policing, um, who is firmly committed to the idea that reform doesn't work and who will argue against reforms on the basis that what you need to do is abolish policing. Um, these are the people who say, you know, we need policing to be fairer. Okay, let's collect a lot of data and look at who is likely to offend and who isn't likely to offend and only police people who are likely to offend. No, you can't do that. That's racist. And it's like, it's not racist. I mean, there are racial disparities, but most black people are not being policed by this. Um, but the thing is, they don't care because the goal is never to criticize the particular policy. It's that they don't want policies other than – they don't want incrementalist policies. They want abolition. They want a dramatic overhaul to society. I think it's a pretty small constituency. I think that's – you know, I think maybe they got a little bit of leeway in Congress or, you know, was on some crazy city councils. But I think most people – I think most reasonable people – you look at polling – uh, 70 80 percent of people opposed to fund the police Apo police abolition 10 percent support it um that you know the the similar rates among black people among poor people like nobody's on board yeah. you get people say we should reform the police we should make change okay everyone's in favor of reform everyone likes that i think you can quibble about what reform should look like um but i'm not again i'm in favor reform means making things better and i'm in favor of making things better so but 
unfortunately, one of the places where these crazy constituencies do have uh, an audience is in prosecutor's offices across the country, district attorneys. Um, tell us a little bit about this rise of very ideological progressive prosecutors yep. and the faces of it. I mean, there's some names that a lot of people know now, like Chesa Boudin, but what's that phenomenon? When did it start? Okay, so, so fundamentally, the progressive prosecutor movement is a brilliant political insight. Um, it's not actually George Soros's name gets associated with this and he's a big funder, although he's not the only one. But it is more generally one of the peculiarities of the American criminal justice system, the adversarial system is um, uh, is the prosecutors are empowered to decide which cases they will and will not fall through on. They have prosecutorial discretion. Mm -hmm. Um Nobody cares about local prosecutor races. They cost like nothing to run in. You know, if if you're if you're George Soros, this is an example, fifty thousand dollars. It's like you know, pocket change to you. And for that, you can buy an office that can decide whether or not things are legal. Um, <laughs> which is which is effectively what progressive prosecutors by by blanket saying we will not prosecute these offenses. Um, they are effectively saying we are going to supersede the discretion of legislatures and unilaterally declare these things are not actually criminal. Uh, we will handle them through some other means or we will not handle them at all. Um, there's a pretty broad spectrum. Lots of people want to be progressive prosecutors because it sounds good. But like there's a pretty broad spectrum of um, what they actually do. So, you know, we talk about Chess Boudin in San Francisco. Uh, Kim Fox in Cook County, which is where Chicago is, uh, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, um, Alvin Bragg now in Manhattan. But what they choose to prosecute and not to prosecute varies pretty wildly, widely. So like, you know, a lot of these guys will come out and day one and say, we're not going to prosecute prostitution anymore. And the response is, prosecutor's offices haven't been prosecuting prostitution for like several days. You can argue whether or not they should, but it's like not a major priority. Mm -hmm. We're not going to, you know. Yeah, the distinction is that they're saying it as opposed to right. kind of quietly doing it. Well, but the other thing is that they will often prosecute, not non-prosecute for more controversial things. So Bragg got in trouble with for, um, and Larry Krasner in Philadelphia has actively pursued a policy of not prosecuting gun possession by prohibited persons, i.e. felons. Um, so under under Krasner, before Krasner, something like 60 percent of felony gun possession, if felon gun possession cases went to trial after him, 20 percent did. Wow. Uh, sorry, were, re resulted in a guilty. It resulted in a guilty play. Um, and the argument is, well, you know, you're, you know, they're they're, they're free to walk around. They're, uh, you know, they're citizens too, and this is racist. And my response is, a, these people are prohibited from carrying a gun. It is illegal. And b, they're carrying a gun so that they can go shoot people with it. Um, and that's what happens. There's a relationship between Larry Krasner's non-prosecution policies and the increase in violent crime in Philadelphia. So, you know, my my thinking is a lot. Some of what progressive prosecutors do is really them just saying out loud what's been true for a long time. And then some of what they do, the sort of more dramatic changes. Um, Alvin Bragg has still committed to not charging anything over 20 years. Uh, he has he has said he's not going to seek jail time except for a very narrow set of uh, felonies, which excludes a variety of like pretty obviously heinous offenses. Um, we have we at Manhattan Institute of recent poll. New Yorkers overwhelmingly oppose uh, not prosecuting a variety of these offenses. Um that's that's pretty radical stuff. And what it does is it puts serious offenders back on the streets more even e more easily, uh, which does have a dramatic impact on crime. So what is the kind of pushback been from uh, the left on a lot of these policy? I've seen a lot of people, particularly on 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 Twitter in California from L.A., San Francisco, saying, I used to love this city, my beautiful city. And now it's hell. <laughs> you know, these prosecutors have ruined our city. I'm moving to Wyoming or whatever. Um, what is what has been kind of the left wing pushback to to this kind of prosecutorial strategy? Yeah. I'm, well, and, you know, San Francisco is sort of weird, um, right? There's, there's lots of rich people and lots of poor people and nobody in between. And the rich mm -hmm. people are unhappy. Um, but it looks like there was there's a poll recently. Uh, Chess Boudin is being there's a recall election against him. He's the San Francisco district attorney. Son um, of weather underground terrorists. Southern, son of weather underground terrorists. Uh, uh, worked for- Translator um, for Hugo Chavez. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, no, it's, it's, it's there. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's there. <laughs> um, no, but so so there's recent polling. Two in three people in San Francisco intend to vote for recalling him. It's not looking good for him. Um, and I think that speaks to, you know, when I said earlier- uh, do you find the police is not a popular proposition? Uh, abolish police is not a popular proposition. The same thing is true. Like, 
crime is a highly salient issue. You can get people to agree that we should sort of make marginal changes, marginal reforms when the crime rate is low. But at the end of the day, when the crime rate goes up, people respond. And I think there's a, you know, within the Democratic Party, there's a sensible majority that says we want reasonable changes, but we also want to keep crime low. I think, I think to his credit, the president has gone out of his way to signal that he is not part of the demolish or defund wing, um, has pushed for more funding for the police, although in sort of complicated ways. Um, you know, partially that's because he's the guy who wrote the 94 crime bill. Uh, he he has a long legacy of being tough on crime. Um, but, I, you know, I so, so I think that, frankly, a minority in the Democratic Party, a very vocal minority, wants these sort of radical changes. They saw their political moment two years ago. They tried to take it. And now there's pushback from uh, from more moderate Democrats. Here in D.C., Murrow Bowser pins all the blame, I think, not unreasonably on the city council. Um, mm-hmm. Murrow Bowser would like to more fully fund the MPD. Murrow Bowser says there's a huge problem with uh, with the courts being open, with uh, the sort of process of law. And I think she's probably right about that. You know, she probably also wants a number of changes. But uh, you look, look at somebody like London Breed in San Francisco, who has been, you know, really trying to deploy the SFPD to clean up the Tenderloin, to clean up these high crime, high disorder areas. Um, you know, there's there's a backlash to the to the sort of brief dominance of of the of the radicals and the activists. Um, and I think that is heartening. I don't know if it'll last. I don't know how it'll work, but it is heartening. Is yeah. the damage already done, though? I mean, if especially I think for. um. You know, you could see a movement in the Democratic Party, which is like, we should fund police more. And, you know, half that funding goes to, you know, social services or whatever. They'll they'll come up with a political assemblage of things that they can get through their party. But at the end of the day, if the cops are demoralized, yep. if there's no recruitment and all the cultural forces, all the protest movements still make life difficult for police. Is it too little, too late? Yeah, you know, I like to I like to say there's a long there, there, there's short run and long run criminal justice capacity problems. Um, the short run, you know, we, we we saw a surge in homicide in 2015, 2016 as the cops were demoralized. It sort of abated, came back down to this pre levels, went back up. 2020, 21. I think we'll probably see a little bit of an increase again this year. I think it'll eventually go back down. I think it'll eventually mean regresses. So things quiet down. But there are long run, even pre Ferguson concerns. Um, the 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 ma- many cities have seen declines in the policing police staffing ratios. Um, the average department is getting older. This is according to the Police Executive Research Forum. Uh, cops they're they're concerned about the rate of hiring versus the rate of retirement. Um, some of that is a spending problem. Some of that is you know after the Great Recession, there's more austerity. Uh, we spend less on everything and that includes cops um some of this is you know there are this competition in the labor market um uh, there are lots of hot jobs right now and that's that's great but it means that people are being you know they they aren't necessarily going after the sort of attractive blue collar job that policing once was they're saying i don't want to do it for cultural reasons i don't want to do it because my friends won't like me i don't do it because i can get a better job somewhere else um I don't think we should make other jobs worse, but you know there there's a long run staffing concern in police departments. Same thing is true in other areas of the criminal justice system. Um, we have a roughly flat number of uh, of judges in the United States. Um, many of our prisons are old. Many of our prisons have overcrowding problems. We have a limited prison capacity. We could spend more on prosecutors. We could spend more on defendants. Um, you know, I think I think there's a large scale. Under, uh, we're terrible at collecting data, and I can talk about that for hours. Um, there's a large skill capacity problem, which I think will durably contribute to uh, crime getting worse and worse in the long run, independent of the short run sort of shocks. You brought up uh, D.C. and also the 94 crime bill uh, a few minutes ago, and I want to come back to D.C. in a minute, but I want to start with the, the, the crime bill. Walk us through... What has changed in both parties from the 94 crime bill to the First Step Act? What is going on? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so so crime was a highly salient issue in the early 90s. Um, this is, you know, you can identify this in the Republican Revolution. You can identify it in Clinton's campaign for the presidency. Um, crime was the... In, in Gallup's polling in the early 1990s, crime was the biggest issue uh, for Americans. That's just not true. It, it doesn't hit the top of the list. It's like five or six even today. Um, crime was a huge issue. It's, you know, decades and decades of increase of just horrible stuff happening in American cities. Um, so there was a bipartisan consensus that something needed to be done. Uh, and they, you know, 
it was a bill crafted by Joe Biden, among other people. So, you know, there, there were things liberals get on board, things conservatives get on board with. Um, there were there were harsher mandatory minimums. There were uh, long sentences. There were uh, there was funding for what ended up being 60,000 police officers, uh, the assault weapons bans in the 94 crime bill, um, which probably didn't work, but but was sort of, a, you know, a feature of, of um, a liberal interest in gun control. Uh, there was just a lot in there and it was a function. It was a function of like that level of public concern about crime um, and the need for people to be tough on crime. And then crime fell, as, as we talked about earlier, it fell dramatically. It declined in salience as an issue. And I think there's, there's a historical cycle. Uh, crime rises and falls. This isn't the first time we've seen a crime wave. Um, it, it happens throughout American history. Uh and and when crime falls, we go, oh, crime is down. We can relax social controls. And then crime goes up. We go, oh, we shouldn't impose social controls. And crime, we, we, we never learned our lesson. Um, and so I think I think what ended up happening is there's this sort of a coalescence of forces, interests, and a little sort of apathy, if not excitement, on the part of the general public about criminal justice reform as a concept. Um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow is a really important coordination point here, making what I alluded to earlier is basically spurious arguments about mass incarceration and what drives it. Um, just factually false ones. Uh, it's never stopped them before. No, that's true. Um, but I think I think um, there's 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 a real energy, and and it ends up getting framed as you know, uh, an issue that conservatives can get behind. It's framed, to, you know, conservatives don't like big government overreach. Conservatives don't like mm-hmm. excess. They don't like, uh, everyone can be very upset about civil asset forfeiture. We can, you know, conservatives believe in liberty. Um, and that results in, you know, a, a, a coalition between the right and the left for criminal justice reform. You talk about the First Step Act, which is the 2017 federal prison reform bill. Um, I like to say, I said at the time, I like to say now, First Step didn't do very much. And when it did, it didn't do very well. Um, the federal prison system is very small. It's about twelve percent of all prisoners. They're always they're also sort of a weird subpopulation. Like most of them are immigration offenders or drug traffickers. Um, the First Step Act sort of carved around the edges. I, some of the carving was reasonable. A lot of the some of the carving was unreasonable. But I think what you know was was weird there was that there was so much uh, energy around what was framed as like this major change. It signified sort of the bipartisan commitment to criminal justice reform as a concept. Um, and then what happened, you know, uh, I I think that that coalition has, if not fully collapsed, and it's certainly uh, far less strong than it was three years ago, four yeah. years, five years ago, um, simply because uh, crime has gone up. It's so much more important as an issue than it was. Yeah, one of the threads that I think I'm most interested in as it relates to the First Step Act is this kind of change that occurred from candidate Trump to President Trump, you know, with the First Step Act. Uh, You know, personnel is policy. Personnel is uh, what we're all about here at American Moment. Can you tell us about, uh, you know, from your perspective, uh, the influence that the people around the president or some of these maybe special interest groups had over this bill? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, I'm, I'm an outsider. I don't have a strong sense of, you know, people certainly talk about the influence of Jared Kushner, the influence of his office. I don't know, no more than you do um, from the popular reporting. I guess what I can say is, you know, A, it seemed to me like, like uh, there, there's a political argument that, Trump looking good on criminal justice reform would carve off vote could carve off the black vote for him in 2020. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, and I think more and generally, I think like suburban white women was a part of that too, and that yeah. also didn't happen. Yeah. Um, well, but I and and you know I think yeah I mean I think that was sort of a bad theory of the case that like marginal for reforms that you sort of tout. Uh, not ultimately going to be the selling point for people voting for Donald Trump. It is. It is pronounced. You know, I think he remained sort of. Uh, Trump, Trump, Trump is rhetorically a throwback, right? I mean, he's he's ultimately like a creature of the '80s and '90s, just as a human being. Um, he's still mad about the, the Central Park Five, uh, <laughs> and 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 you know, I think there. Why was there a disparity between Trump's rhetoric and Trump's action? I don't know. It's a disparity between Trump's rhetoric and Trump's action on everything. So I don't know what to make. You know, I I I think he went where the wind was blowing. Mm. Uh, tell us specifically what. Did the first step act do that made America less safe? What were the consequences of it? Oh gosh, I have to dig this up. Um, 
Yeah. So the major innovation of first step is they've a they've a um, time credit where a good time credit release program people get out early if they participate in recidivism reduction programming. Um, they're still in the process of like rolling this out and identifying which recidivism reduction programming actually works because um, it like kind of. We, we, we don't have good answers. Um, it is entirely possible that the, some of the many of those good time credits will be applied to programs that don't work, that sort of skate by an analysis, and so people just get let out earlier. Um, that that could work out. Um, it had a it had a, a more expansive compassionate release, which struck me as basically reasonable. Uh, they revised down the what's referred to as the crack powder cocaine sentencing disparity, which is basically the ratio between. Uh, the volume of crack cocaine, the volume of powder cocaine that can get you certain mandatory minima. U.S. Sentencing Commission said that um, the people who were released by that were disproportionately uh, were disproportionately career offenders, serious offenders, um, which is alarming to me. Uh, gosh, what else was in first step? Um, yeah, there was. I mean, there's some money for state second chances. You know, I think. I think. Again, a lot of what it did was. First of all, some of what it's done is not yet fully implemented. B, a lot of what it did was carve around the edges. It said, here are a couple thousand people here, a couple thousand people there, some retroactivity here, some retroactivity there. Uh, some of that I'm fine with. Some of that, I think, ends up putting serious drug dealers back in the street, which I'm not fine with. Um, there were also uh, Senator Tom Cotton uh, made a great deal of effort to exclude more people from eligibility for credits. Um, there were a whole host of serious dealers, serious offenders who were not technically violent, but were obviously violent, who included in the first draft. Some of them didn't make it through to the final draft. Some of them did. What's so, the archetypical type of person that is? Uh, I think, so I think terrorists were excluded. But I'm not actually <laughs> sure about that. I mean, it's a small population. Um, more general, I mean, so the, the thing, about, again, the thing about federal prison is that it's mostly drug offenders, um, but it's mostly like interstate drug traffickers. It's like guys who come in from Mexico um, or guys who are moving large quantities of drugs over the border. And so mostly it's like leniency for those people. Um, in some senses, leniency can be good for individual offenders, but in other senses, you're letting out serious drug traffickers. And that's alarming to me. Especially like Mexican drug traffickers, like those, a lot of those cartels are notorious for like cutting people's hands off and like skinning them alive and like terrible Terrible yeah. things. Not great. Yeah. Not great. Um, but First Step Act was never meant to be the be-all, end-all of the plan. There was a second and third Step Act plan. What What is it that this weird right libertarian left progressive coalition on criminal justice wants to do or can – what is it that those two coalitions agree on to do for a second and third step? Yeah, I'm I, – I can't sort of recite – components of subsequent agendas. But what I can say in general is that the way that the argument was framed is America is an outlier in incarceration. We have like a very high incarceration rate relative to the rest of the developed world. Is that um, true? E well, yes. So what, um, assume, well, okay. We, it is often claimed the highest incarceration rate on earth. And the response is, okay, but like Russia and China are lying. Um, <laughs> the white women who post all these graphics about how many people we have in prison on Instagram have to know, is it true? <laughs> yeah. Is it true? Yeah. So so we have a high measured incarceration rate. And the question is not, the wrong question is not, do we have a high incarceration rate relative to our peers? It's do we have a high incarceration rate relative to what our incarceration rate should be? One of the things I like to say about the United States, one of the things I'll say is that there are two kinds of countries. Countries Countries with high state capacity and low propensity to crime. So like like much of Europe, just like long and storied history, not very much violent crime, also high state capacity. There are a lot of countries that have a high propensity to violent crime and low state capacity, right? Like Honduras having a lower incarceration rate than us is not actually a win for Honduras. Honduras <laughs> would be safer if more people were in prison. Yeah, um, so true. <laughs> America is in this weird place where we are high state capacity. But also we've, we've got a lot of wealth. We've got a lot of place to put people. But also we have a long and storied history of violent crime. Um, the, the, his, the criminological historian Eric Monkinen documents he, – he worked out the homicide rates in New York going back several centuries and the homicide rates in London going back several centuries. And the homicide rates in New York are consistently like 6x even after you get rid <laughs> of, gun, of gun crime. Yeah. 
Um, America is a violent country. There are a whole host of reasons why that would be. You know, Mankinen attributes that we were highly individualist. Um, we have relative distrust of government. Uh, we have like very strong adversarial system and lots of procedural prote- due process protections. Um, these are, in my view, often good things. Uh, but they do mean that we have a tradition of uh, violent offending that is just different from our peers. So my view is like, yeah, we have a high incarceration rate, but also homicide clearance rates, you know, half of homicides in many cities, much fewer than much lower than half get cleared. There are lots of criminals out there who should be in prison who aren't. So for anyone you could let out, there's probably somebody who you should put in. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the argument is simply the number is big and ugly. And my response is, yeah, but how much lower can we really drive it without losing public safety? The left's answer to this is that it's because we have way too many guns. Um, I like guns. Guns are fun. Um, I also like guns because this is a violent town and I would like to protect my home. Um, what, what's, what's your read on the way gun violence, gun ownership in the United States interfaces with the crime question? Yeah, I mean, so so I, I I factually agree that America would be a less violent place if we had 400 million fewer guns. I think that's just true. Guns facilitate violence. Um, I think the following two things are also true. The first one is that most gun control interventions do not reduce actual gun violence because most gun control inve- interventions uh, target law-abiding gun owners who are not themselves prone to violence. Um, the 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 canonical example is a gun buyback program, right? Gun buyback programs are real nice, except the only people who take their guns in to be bought back are the sort of people who are not going to use their guns to like gun each other down the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, assault weapon, the assault weapons ban we know didn't work in the nineties. Uh, maybe that has to do with tailoring. Um, but the reality is, you know, look, there are four hundred million guns in the United States. If if we got rid of the Second Amendment tomorrow, which I would not support, but if we got rid of the Second Amendment tomorrow. You're not going to undo that. You can't put it back in the box. Like that is that is a condition of our political reality. And so the question for me is never, you know, yeah, sure, America's a lot of guns, but that that's just who we are. Um, we could try to reduce it at the margins. I think this is a good argument. The most effective interventions are going after gun criminals, or prosecuting felons for gun possession, or rounding up people who possess gun, or rounding up uh, gun offenders more aggressively, which has been a priority of. Both this and the last administration is a good use of federal resources. Um, but I think that that is the sort of extent of what policy can realistically do to address that as as le- like I ultimately agree. Guns guns are a big driver of violence in the United States, but I'm not sure how much we can do about it relative to other things that we can do to reduce violence. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of the things that are done, you know, don't seem to work very well. Uh so like DC is an example, right? Uh DC has only had concealed carry permits for the last couple of years uh last i saw there are i think about 2000 uh, i'm surprised uh, it's that many yeah about 2000 in a in a city of i think it's seven really that few yeah 2000 and <laughs> yeah my um my permit number is like 1400 so you have, yeah. Yeah. how did you get a permit um, yeah I it's we, um, we, can, <laughs> we can talk about that later we'll talk but, about it later but, but but there are about uh uh 2000 permits or so um and so You'd think that would make DC one of the right. one of the safest places to like not get shot, right? Definitely not the, the case. tough cookie. The, <laughs> the, no, but I mean, and, and this is common rhetoric from particularly progressive city leaders is the problem is the flow of is is gun trafficking. The problem is that we don't have strict enough gun laws. My response is like New York State has incredibly strict gun laws. California incredibly strict gun laws. Uh, New York City incredibly strict gun laws, and yet they still have high levels of gun violence. And this is to me a sign that the problem is not guns per se. The problem is not going after. I am I'm open to being persuaded that ghost guns are a more serious issue than I originally thought. I've talked to some prosecutors who think this, that we should be taking that issue more seriously. What's a ghost gun? Um, is, is a, a, a I'm going to disagree with that when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can buy a part of the gun online and you 3D print the rest of it, and so it okay. isn't registered. Um, I, I'm, I'm open to being persuaded either way, is what I would say. Um, it does seem like a potential issue, and... What I know is that prosecutors I've talked to say they're coming up more and more and more, and it makes it harder to trace, makes it harder to prosecute. I think the only people that I know that are into that stuff are definitely normal guys who yeah. are just who are just like well, so it is a, it is like home defense type thing, and the parts that they want were arbitrarily made illegal, and <laughs> so they're just. You know, they're like, yeah, I want to shoot this in my backyard and maybe do some home defense with it. But I've I. I have personally now. I'm not a prosecutor or DA or anything, but I, 
I have personally never seen someone like who needs to rob a 7-Eleven and also has a 3D printer at home. Yeah, so, I mean, what, it, what, it's, what it's really about is, um, on the one hand, yes, the average the average gun, crime gun has been on the market for seven or eight years. Um, mm-hmm. it, the time between when it was sold and when it was actually used in crime, seven to eight years. Um, this is the and ATF that term says. is called time to crime? It is called time to crime. I heard that earlier. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> that's, a good time. that's a good term. Um, so, it, you know, guns guns sort of float around. On the other hand, look, the, it's it's less the guy who's robbing a 7-Eleven and more the guy who wants to do a, um, who wants to do a drive-by. Guys who run gangs are not stupid. Um, you know, it is, I, I think it's right that it's your average nerd who is a 3D printer. But when you realize you can get an untraceable gun, uh, one guy in the gang has to understand how it works in order for everybody to get access to them. I don't think it's a big problem right An now. An organized crime can do that. An organized yeah, crime can do that. Yeah. I don't think it's a big problem right now. I think we talk to prosecutors, they say it's a growing problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget how we got on the topic of ghost guns, except to say, you know, the uh, <laughs> the most effective means in all of these circumstances have much more to do with going after criminals than they do have to go do with going after guns. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's, it's often a dodge rhetorically to focus on guns rather than focus on who's shooting. Okay. Is organized crime still a thing? I mean, I've, I've seen the Batman movies. I'm going to watch The Godfather this week. I mean, the, like, it feels like the... You should go see the new Batman movie first, no. by the way. Um, all the wrong people like it. Um, <laughs> the archetypical criminality in American cities that was sort of immortalized in pop culture was organized crime, usually ethnic organized crime. Is that still the case? Was that never the case? Um, What's that story? So, so a couple of things are true. One is that, uh, yes, there's still sort of those, you know, there's still crime families. There's still ethnic organized crime. We did a pretty good job decapitating them in the six, seven. Well, okay, there have been several series of like mob, mass mob prosecutions. Um, you like pick these guys up on mass. This is Rico was really successful in the sixties and seventies. Um, modern and this co- is everyone from like mafia and triads to like Bloods and Crips. Well, so and, like, so those are distinct. Okay. Organized crime. So organized crime is usually defined as people who engage in uh, protection. Uh, they 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 organize they organize to extract protection money from people. Mm. Gangs are anywhere from organized crime to the dudes on your block who you roll with. Um, just to use the you know. <laughs> Uh, to use the hip link. Right. I mean, the, the historical study, Thrasher's, the, the earliest studies of gangs are just like, why do teenagers get together and cause trouble? And in some senses, that's what a gang is still. It's a group of te- like, uh, the, the average gang member ages out by his early 20s. He ages into crime in his early teens. He ages out by his early 20s. Um, gangs are still very much a thing. But in the same sense, you know, gangs have become decentralized just like everything else has become decentralized. A, because of effective decapitation, most of the guys who lead gangs are now in prison and will be in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, Certainly who led sort of legacy gangs. But B, because uh, particularly because of the internet and social media, you know, anyone can be in a gang. It can be decentralized. You know, it's just who you hang out with. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the affiliations are much looser than they were in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the incentives have changed, too. The crack trade is different. Um, gangs still sell drugs, but the drugs they're selling is different. And they're competing with the cartels in a way they didn't historically. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, again, that, you know, the, the big trend overall is that decentralization, is that, like, you know, where it once was some organized crime organizations, it's now – it was always some guys hanging out, but it's really the guys on this block and the guys on that block and the guys on this block and the guys on that block. Um, and that's what drives a lot of violence still is, you know, a, much violence in American Big City is still gang violence, but it's different from the gang violence of the 80s. Gotcha. So uh, now that you brought up organized crime gangs, we get to talk about this new bugbear topic of mine, prohibition. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about this before the show, and I want to make sure we got the chance to talk about it. Uh, you were mentioning that you were working on some like pro a paper. Uh, uh, <laughs> pro prohibition um, paper. So let's let's talk about that. I would not I would not call it pro. pro well, so I'll, I'll say a prohibition. Well, I'll say the paper first, and I'll talk a little bit prohibition. Um, I'm I'm working on a paper with a colleague that'll come out some months from now. Um, but it's really about alcohol control and crime control. And our argument is that alcohol is involved in an alarming number of crimes. Uh, in 2016, 30% of people in prison had been drinking at the time of their offense, for example. Um, there's really high-quality evidence that says uh, access to alcohol is uh, causally linked to propensity to offend in a variety of ways. Um, and so our argument is really you should understand alcohol control as a preventative means for deterring crime. We talk through a variety of ways in which you can do that. 
Um, that means better liquor enforcement. That means uh, more proactive uh, probation policies. Uh, for people who are involved in alcohol-related offenses. Um, that does mean what we talk about in the paper as focused prohibition. Um, so there is good evidence. Uh, I, I show some of it. There's other historical evidence that uh, dry jurisdictions are lower in crime than wet jurisdictions causally. When you switch from one to the other, crime goes up or down. Uh you know, I, I, there are pros and, cron, pros and cons to prohibition as like as as a general social policy. Um, uh, Herbert Hoover called it the great experiment. Um, it was the it was it was it was a real mode of American democracy. We said we want to get rid of this, and we experimented with it, and we decided we don't want to do that anymore. Um, I think it is un, you know it's outside the Overton window to prohibit alcohol nationwide, but individual jurisdictions don't test Nick, <laughs> <laughs> don't test me. <laughs> precincts, uh, yeah. local areas are empowered to in many uh, in in the city of Chicago. Individual voting precincts are empowered under the 1934 Illinois Liquor Control Act to vote themselves dry, and they do on a regular basis. It's a way to shut down a problematic bar or problematic liquor store, um, and I think there's there's a lot of merit to that policy of saying. In this area, the benefits of alcohol, the cost of alcohol outweigh the benefits. Um, and we sort of encourage people to take that more seriously as a tool that is underrecognized. Yeah, I just finished reading this book this morning called um, Breaking, I think it's called Breaking the Liquor Machine or Destroying the Liquor Machine or something. It came out during, during Smashing COVID. Smashing the Liquor Machine. Smash, I think that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it's like this big, thick book. It was actually um, Emma got it. Emma and Jack got it for me for my birthday. That was that was how I ended up reading this book. But it's written by this, um, and I know that you and I talked about it. But I'm giving our our listeners and our watchers some context. Uh, it's written by this guy. He's more left leaning, and he, his whole basic theory is that, um, which I think is correct, was that prohibition and the temperance movement was more of a a progressive thing than a conservative thing because it was aimed at um, kind of getting the working people away from this predatory uh, liquor traffic. And one of the things that he talks about in the end of the in the conclusion at the end, which which I was reading this morning is kind of how we've thought about this throughout history, that there was kind of this change in the 1960s in the way that we started thinking about liberty and choice, the difference between um, individual liberty and economic liberty. They didn't, prohibition didn't make it illegal to drink. It made it illegal to uh, sell uh, drink, which, you know, we today, we view those as the same thing. But at the time that was, that was not the case. So anyway, it was just, I just want to plug that. Well, and I, it's super and I, interesting. I, well, I think um, I mean I do I do a fair amount of work on on drugs and drug policy, and I think the same thing is true there. Um, and you know, part of part of what I think about in that broader sense is that the preconditions of freedom are greater than sort of the absence of coercion, the absence of uh, uh, you know form of prohibition from the state, um, like. Uh, alcohol in excess deprives of freedom. Being being addicted to alcohol deprives of freedom. Being addicted to opioids, being addicted to drugs deprives of freedom. Um, in a sense, living in a community where you cannot imagine tomorrow because of the level of crime deprives of freedom. You are not fully free as a Republican citizen. And I think you know that 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 is something that they understood. Is that you know the the argument was should we be free? Are we more free if alcohol is per- permitted? Or are we more free if alcohol is banned? Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that sort of robust notion of freedom has is something that we've lost. Now we're on my bugbear, which is drug policy. Um, what a how, how does the uh, you know changes in drug policy over the last decade or two interface with all these crime statistics? There's two big trends that I can think of. Uh, one is the state by state legalization or decriminalization of marijuana, and the second is the broad sort of decrease in prosecutions and intensity of enforcement of all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think. Uh, I am I am skeptical of the Alex Berenson thesis that marijuana legalization will lead to violent crime increases. Um, I don't buy that. Um, I do think it is sort of a separate. I mean, it's 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 a separate calculus in my head. Of basically, the benefits of free access to marijuana outweigh the costs, and under what regime? You know, my view my view on marijuana is really uh, so much depends upon how you're actually selling it. Um, that there you know there are better and worse regimes, and most of the regimes we picked are the worst ones. Um, Say more about them. Uh, yeah. Well, so, you know, and a lot of this is influenced by the late Mark Kleiman, who's a, who's a uh, political scientist at NYU. He's sort of the father of uh, modern serious thinking about drug policy. And, 
you know, one way to frame Kleiman's argument is that the goal of a drug legalization regime should be to maximally extract benefit to minimize the costs associated. You want to you want to tax users heavily, um, or you want to limit how they consume, how they're allowed to be targeted by advertisers, and you want to redistribute the the tax gains from your legal marijuana regime to minimize the social harms that are associated with marijuana. Um, And I think it's a good model. I think there are lots of ways you can do that model. I think you can do it through smart taxation. I think you can do it through regulation. You can do it through a a state store system, which I am often partial to. And instead, sort of states have been pretty Wild West free reign, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. Um, I think sort of maximizes costs and minimizes benefits. the other question about, you know, no pot, I mean, the, the the shape of the drug trade has changed dramatically since the, the 1980s is the thing to understand. Um, in the 1980s, drug death basically meant homicide. It meant the people who were killed in the process of selling crack, people didn't really die from consuming crack. They were addicted to it, but they didn't die. Um, yeah, the relatively low drug OD deaths in the 1980s because during the crack epidemic. The thing that is true now is that there's less violence associated with the drug cra- trade because it has been, in a sense, professionalized. Um a lot of that's because it's been taken over by the Mexican cartels who would rather that their guys get easily deported than having to spend time in an American prison as they don't want them to get involved in violence. They'd rather they just get sent back to Mexico. Um, but it's also the case that the drugs have become much deadlier, um, largely because they are synthetic, uh, either opioids or methamphetamine, uh, which are far more potent, far more likely to kill. Um, so, so, you know, I think, I think that there's a, that the reduction capacity and the reduction in prosecution is having harmful effects. I think it is more having harmful effects in how it manages the impacts of the drug market directly on Americans than it is on sort of violent crime as a separate issue. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You mentioned that you were supportive of uh, state stores. Um, I kind of came of age in Texas, and so it was like concept that wasn't even on my horizons and most of the states i lived in growing up didn't have those and then i moved to the dc area and i was like wait a second all of the liquor stores in virginia are owned by the government that's that's weird and interesting and cool what tell us more about that system why does that help or hurt um uh i so i'm i'm from pennsylvania where liquor laws make no sense um (laughs) in in pennsylvania you're allowed to be a beer distributor but you also have to sell food and so you can go into these beer distributors and they've like hot dogs on a warming tray that nice. nobody ever buys and then huge quantities of beer. Um, no, I mean, an ABC uh, uh, um, Alcoholic Beverage Commission store, uh, you you centralize the sale of spirits through uh, stores that are owned by the state. They get all the revenue and then you can redirect that revenue to uh, treatment, to uh, recommends for people who are killed by drug driving, to prosecution for drunk drivers, to uh, any uh, addressing any of the harms that are associated with alcohol. And a similar model, of, you know, it's it's like taxation where you're extracting some cost from the problematic consumers, but it's more direct. Mm-hmm. So the the state system was actually based on um, the like the original state system back in like the early 1900s was based on uh, Sweden's Gothenburg system. They uh, basically what they did was they had state run liquor stores but they were like managed by members of the community who got paid five percent of the profits to basically redirect those funds to to the community uh and 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 they also taxed it heavily that's why if you go to any nordic country like iceland uh is like the costs are like 40 percent higher for alcohol if you buy any because they just tax it extremely heavily and then pour all that money back into the community so it's kind of like a similar idea we just don't tax it as much yeah uh um the the revenues of I, I i did this math and i don't remember the exact numbers but the revenues from federal alcohol taxation have been consumed entirely by um inflation because they're 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 taxing absolute number of dollars per uh gallon of pure alcohol um and it's like it's it's been oh, 10, that's how the tax yeah, is structured it's, is- it's 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 not a percentage um so it's been 1050 for like uh, i think it's 1750 now i don't remember the exact number for you know decades um, Seventeen dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, I gotta go, a gallon don't, of don't, spirit. Don't quote me on that because I don't remember the okay. exact ratios. But it's okay. a relatively low number. But, but, but which per is worth, gallon is for like per what, a gallon of what? Like of, 40% of, spirit? yeah, yeah. It's like per half gallon of uh, of yeah. Well, and that was the most like amazing thing about prohibition too is that before we introduced the income tax, like alcohol tax, made up a very significant part of the federal budget. Like it was a huge like we gave up a ton of money to be able to to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the United States, I mean we we've, we've named rebellions in this country after different spirits. There That's was true. something called the Whiskey Rebellion. That's true. Um 
That's um that's exceptionally uh, interesting. Um, I had one kind of final thread I wanted to pick up on, which is that as policing and the state has retreated from its role in public safety, I think you've seen a rise in the privatization of that legitimate state role. Uh, there's two acute examples that I'm a little bit familiar with. One is that I recently found out that DC has a rebate system if you install uh, video cameras outside of your house. The second um, is uh, in cities in Texas, I've heard pretty substantial rumors that a lot of the mayors have um, you know, created relationships with the richest communities in their cities and said, hey, we're going to, you know, help you guys get private security a lot easier and facilitate that relationship so that we can manage our political constituency to the left that wants us to defund the police, but your communities um, as safe as ever. Tell us about the privatization of the security yeah. um, of um, the country. So what I can say in general is that we have a relatively large number of private security officers in the United States. There are some estimates that we have more private than public. Um, uh, I have and seen, that's from mall cop to like yeah. guy from the movie. Who's right. Like I am a you know. yeah. And you know my 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 view on uh, my view on that is like uh, public safety should be a public good. Um, in in not in the sort of robust economic sense, but in the sense of like if we live in a if we live in a civilized society, everyone needs to have access to public safety. It should not be stratified on the basis of wealth. And this mm-hmm. is one of the sort of disturbing impacts of defund the police when you stop providing. Mm-hmm. Uh, policing as a public service, then rich places keep poor people out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they get their own pri- they get their own private good that is security, and they don't let other people have access to it. I think it's a real harm that's done by the sort of you know austerity mindset. Is is when you don't have uh, when when you go look at Chicago in the '90s, the same private policing was provided by gangs if you were too poor. Um, because the cops wouldn't come to those neighborhoods except to uh, extract bribes. Um. So I think I think you know we we've seen what that model looks like. It is a world in which the poor are policed by criminals and the rich are keep to themselves, and it's far preferable that everyone you know share in the same basic resource. Like everybody from the from not quite the most radical libertarian, but the most radical, maybe slightly less than the most radical libertarian, to like you know the most serious socialist agrees that the state is in the business of providing safety. Um, and, and it or at seems, least should be, whether or not it's yeah, actively pursuing the, 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 that. The, the, the state ought to be in the business of providing safety. That's a legitimate function of yeah. government. And if that's true, that has to be true for everybody. And, you know, uh, I'm not against private security, but mm-hmm. I do think that that trend is alarming. And so mm-hmm. far as this deprivation of access to that fundamental good. Yeah. Charles, you recently started a podcast with um, I did. who was uh, um, Aaron Siberian. Yeah, Aaron Siberian. I know his name. Oh, yeah, I've yeah. been taken to calling him the Yale Law School reporter at the Washington yeah, Free yeah. Week. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I asked him recently at an event. I was like, is that your beat? Is that what they <laughs> label you? And he's like, no other uh, woke elite institutions also. I was yeah. like, ah, I see. I understand. Uh, tell us about the podcast. Uh, where can people find we it? We have what, a new podcast. To it's anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's called Institutionalized. It's me and my friend Aaron. We went to college together. Uh, I'm basically you know, oh no! T- does that mean you went to Yale? Oh, that's very unfortunate. Okay. That's okay. Well, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm writing his coattails. Um, he has more Twitter followers than I do. <laughs> no, so so Aaron and I. It's it's about it's called institutionalized. The tagline. It's about American institutions and why they've gone crazy. Every week we have a conversation with smart, interesting people about an American institution. We try to ask them hard questions. Uh, we try to you know engage in a good conversation. We just had uh, Max Eden at AEI talking about schools. Um, we have episodes coming up on the medical establishment, on the law, on dating, on genetics, just across the board. Um, mm-hmm. I encourage people to check that out. Very good. And where can people follow the rest of your work and uh, everything you're doing on the crime issue? Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Charles F. Lehman, L-E-H-M-A-N. Um, and I'm always uh, at City Journal, which is the Manhattan Institute's um, in-house publication, as well as all my reports are out through the Manhattan Institute. That's manhattan-institute.org and city-journal.org. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We certainly had fun recording it, even though we're we're all a little exhausted. Um, Charles brings a ton of energy. He knows his issue. Um, he's the kind of person that uh, we wish existed on really every issue. And there needs to be a lot more of him, too. I mean, I, I'm trying to think about all the issues where we don't have someone who's, you know, under the age of 40 bajillion years old who can actually talk compellingly and in, in, in an educated manner about what is at its core like a 
fundamental public policy issues. So, um, you know, part of the reason we exist is to hopefully try to create more people like Charles. Um, he did a great job. Go check out his podcast. Um, him and Aaron are, are smart cookies. We don't agree on everything, but um, they uh, they have something interesting and intelligent to contribute to uh, the debate. And, um, you know, listening to another set of white guys with a podcast is always in the offing, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jake's going to edit that one out. No, he's not. Uh, uh, Jake... <laughs> Do not edit that. Um, as always, guys, uh, please make sure to check out AmericanMoment.org. You can find everything we have cooking. We just closed the application for the Fellowship for American Statecraft and Foundations of American Statecraft. So thank you to everyone who applied for those. Those programs will be underway in the coming weeks and months. Um, but you can check out Amcanon. You can check out the archives from Up from Chaos, Conserving American Security, the archives of this podcast. Uh, go to Rumble to see the full archives of this podcast because the Stephen K. Bannon interview is no longer on YouTube. Um, and uh, be sure to check out everything we have cooking at AmericanMoment.org. Thank you guys for listening as always, and we'll see you next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.